With relative peace restored in the region, the Chibok girls who have been released are able to return home for Christmas. While UN officials warn of a possible genocide in South Sudan, the UN Security Council decides not to impose an arms embargo or further sanctions. And the centuries-old frankincense trade in Somaliland. It is under threat as trees die off from over-harvesting. Africa 54 starts right now. Hello, I'm Jockey Rogers at Channel Television here in Lagos. Welcome to our show as we go around the continent to bring you a variety of stories from across Africa. And I'm Vincent McCory of Voice of America coming to you from our global headquarters in Washington. It's a new year and normalcy is returning to Chibok, the town in Borno State, northeast Nigeria, where over 200 schoolgirls were abducted from their dormitory on the 14th of April 2014 by Boko Haram insurgents. Now, the release of 21 of the girls earlier in October brought renewed hope and now with the decimation of the terrorists and relative peace restored in the region, the girls were able to return to Chibok to spend Christmas with their families. Channel's television's correspondent, Blessing Tuna, compiled this report. It's joy and excitement as residents of Chibok in Borno State celebrate the relative peace that has now replaced the horrors of Boko Haram attacks. Most unforgettable, being the kidnap of over 200 of their daughters. Thanks to the sustained fight against insurgency by the Nigerian army and volunteer vigilante, Chibok community, like much of the northeast region, is safe again. After the kidnap of the girls, more people came to join us. In the past, we were not more than 50. We have engaged Boko Haram in battles and arrested some. And we submit the arms we recover to the army. The rooting out of the terrorists made it possible for the 21 freed schoolgirls to return to Chibok for Christmas, expectedly amid tight security. Only close family members were allowed access. Nevertheless, they were happy that they could see their children. In a town of about 66,000 people, almost every family in Chibok has been affected by the April 2014 abduction. They still pray for the safe return of the other girls. Some are still having the expectation that these girls will come back as their counterparts. But you know, an occasion like this, they are not happy because theirs is not there. And you don't know whether the girl is alive or not, her state of uh, uh, whether she is okay or not. Meanwhile, the state government is embarking on reconstruction of damaged infrastructure, including hospitals, roads and schools. <laughs> They have released 500 million naira. I have not seen what they did in government secondary school chip. We shall go to the federal government and the Safe School Initiative and the Federal Ministry of Finance and demand what they did with the money. People should stop buying and selling with the name of Chibo. The celebration continues in Chibok and in other parts of the state, such as Damasak, where gallant military personnel have recaptured what were formerly notorious strongholds of the invaders. The federal government of Nigeria has announced the defeat of the terrorist group following the takeover of Sembisa Forest. Well, this is some good news. And for more on this development, security consultant and blogger Chidi Wanu joins us via Skype from London. Welcome to Africa 54. Thank you for having me. What impact will this victory have on the war against terror in Nigeria? Without doubt, it is a, it's a good victory because the army have finally taken at least, even if not complete control, they have broken the back of enemy, uh, the enemy's organized resistance within Sambisa Forest. The, the more immediate impact that, uh, that it will have will be a shift of operations, particularly to the south and to the east of Meduguri, uh, to different areas. So you'll see a change in the dynamics of enemy operations, a, an increase in ambushes with IEDs and small arms, and less set-piece attacks. However, to the north around Lake Chad and to the east in the Mandara Mountains, 
I expect an increased uh, tempo and an, an increased number of attacks as the enemy tries to rebalance their loss to the south of uh, Medjugorje. Well, there were hopes that clearing Sambisa Forest may guarantee the release of the other Chibel girls and the rest of the terrorists, but this is yet to happen. What do you think? And that, that was a very unlikely probability because this operation, like any other operation of this nature, was highly um, advertised. It, was very, it, it would have been difficult for the enemy not to know that they were going to be attacked by Nigerian forces in the Sambisa Forest. So they would have taken precaution to move their prized assets, such as their heavy weapons, their prized adoptees like the GSS Chibok abductees, and also their leadership, people like Shekau and his uh, inner council, his Shura council. So it's very likely that they had already been displaced before the offensive actually took hold, and all the people that were left were simply foot soldiers. But the enemy is still a far shadow from what they were this time last year, or even it's a, definitely from what they were in 2014. So they are very close to defeat, but they are in no way defeated. What should be the next line of action now to secure the release of the rest of the girls? The only thing the government can really do at this point is to continue doing exactly what they're doing. On one hand, they're negotiating. I think those negotiations are being led by the DSS. And at the same time, you continue with the military action because the enemy will not negotiate unless they are under pressure. So the military action has to continue. And you either rescue those girls by force or by negotiation. But either which way, there's no, there's no deviation. There's no magic wands. There's no magic solution to the problem. You have to keep up the military pressure on them. And at the same time, try and convince those that are willing to negotiate to negotiate. Anything else is just a waste of time. Security consultant Chidi Wano, thank you so much for joining us on Africa 54. Thank you for having me. Well, the UN Security Council recently decided not to adopt a U.S. resolution to impose an arms embargo and further sanctions on South Sudan, despite warnings of possible genocide. Africa 54's Esther Gidu Ewart has more on what refugees escaping South Sudan's violence are facing. Bidi Bidi town in northern Uganda is now home to thousands of South Sudanese who are arriving daily. Buses ferrying in new arrivals can be seen pulling into the reception centers in the middle of the night to welcome the many hungry and haggard looking boys, girls, mothers cuddling small babies, old women and men into the camp. South Sudan war first broke out in December 2013 after President Salva Kiir fired his then Vice President Riek Machar and the political rivalry between them quickly developed into a military confrontation. Joyce Kiden arrived at the camp this month, leaving her village of Yeu with her five children shortly after her husband was abducted by government soldiers. We had to run because these people came in the night and started burning houses. But what made me run is when the government helicopters came and started shooting indiscriminately in populated areas and many people got killed. The conflict ended in a peace deal in August 2015, and Machar, who had left the country after the war started, subsequently returned to Juba in April 2016, only to flee the country again amid renewed fighting in July. He has since called on his supporters to mount an armed resistance. Addressing the UN Security Council, outgoing UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon warned if the international community fails to act now, South Sudan will be on a trajectory towards mass atrocities. Reports suggested that President Salva Kiir and his loyalists are contemplating a new military offensive in the coming days against the SPLM in opposition. Moreover, there are clear indications that Vig Machal and other opposition groups are pursuing a military escalation. Back in Uganda, authorities say the refugee camp has reached its maximum capacity. The spokesman for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in Uganda, Charles Yaxley, says the displaced civilians arriving there are mainly from the equatorial regions where opportunistic crimes fueled by ethnic killings sexual violence, looting and burning have turned villages and towns into death traps. What we're seeing is a already dire situation getting even worse. And with political solutions in short supply, uh, it appears there'll be no end in sight anytime soon. Um, and tell us 
horrific and barbaric tales of violence that they're escaping from. During an emergency session convened in Geneva, the chairperson for the Commission on Human Rights in South Sudan, Yasmin Suka, drew special attention to the ongoing sexual violence in civilian camps. And a UN survey found that 70% of women in the camp had been raped since the conflict erupted, the vast majority of them not by unarmed, unknown men, but by police or soldiers, and a staggering 78% of them had been forced to watch someone else being sexually violated. During the conference, South Sudan's ambassador, Kual Alor Kual Arop, sought to defend his government. Because the government has not been given the chance to study and reply the glaring allegations contained in the statements of the distinguished members who spoke. The Republic of South Sudan, as an independent and a sovereign state, <laughs> reserves the right to take an appropriate action it deems fit at an appropriate time. With the massive influx of refugees to Uganda showing no signs of ending, UNHCR fears its ability to respond could be severely undermined as funds fall short. Esther Gidu Ewart, VOA News, Washington. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54 and check out our headlines 24-7 at voaafrica.com. Coming up, aid for displaced persons with special needs in Nigeria's northeast region. That story after the break. Stay with us.